The whole speaker's studio will never be used. Okay. Good morning and welcome to Broker Briefing, Australia's premier digital platform for brokers and investors, live streaming video presentations from ASX listed companies. I'm Jane Morgan and thank you for joining me today for our September Tech and Biotech Investor Webinar. Today we'll be joined by six companies, Neuroscientific Biopharmaceuticals, Space Talk, Pharmost, Vectus Biosystems, Nanoview and Archer Materials. Up first, we have a presentation from Neuroscientific Biopharmaceuticals with the ticker code NSB. 
a company developing novel drug therapies for neurogenerative conditions. To tell us more, we are joined by Director of Operations, Dr. Alexandra Heaton. Good morning, Alex. Hi, Jane. Thanks so much. Let me bring up your presentation and we'll jump into it. Okay, so um, neuroscientific biopharmaceuticals. Um, my name's Alexandra Heaton. Next slide, please. Thanks. So in my presentation, I plan to provide you with a corporate overview of NSB, talk about the target markets we're focused on, the mechanism of action of our drug, Empton B, and then go into the very exciting in vitro and in vivo preclinical data we've gathered to date. And finally, go through our R&D timelines. Next slide, please. To give you a brief overview of our corporate structure, the company listed in an oversubscribed IPO in July 2018. Our market cap is currently sitting at 52 million. Our largest shareholders include McRae Investment, which is the large private family office of Clough family, who are famous for Clough Engineering, and a Swiss-based fund called Alpha Swiss. We're in a very strong financial position with 13.5 million cash on hand, and that's more than enough to see us through for the next 12 months. Next slide. NSB's leadership team is a good mix of both the technical capabilities and capital market experience. The company was founded by Matt and Anton, who both have strong backgrounds in biotechnology commercialization. We've, um, we recently had the good fortune of um, bringing on Paul Rennie as chairman and Paul's the founder and current CEO of Paradigm Pharmaceuticals. Um, he took this company from a biotech startup to one that's currently running a phase three clinical trial with a market cap of half a billion dollars. Next slide. NSB is a Perth-based drug development company developing targeted peptides with broad therapeutic application. Our lead indication in, um, is in ophthalmology is glaucoma and our lead indication in neurology is MS and Alzheimer's disease. But the potential applications extend beyond these two diseases and there are other conditions that we may be able to impact as well. Next slide, please. So what is our drug and how is it made? When the body encounters injury, we have an immune protein called metallothionine 2, which gets to work repairing the damage. Now, metallothionine is a very well-known pro-survival protein um, there's only so much of it the body can make. So what we've done is we've isolated the most active site on this protein and copied it synthetically. And this is called a peptide and our peptide is called Empton B. Because it's manufactured synthetically, we've also been able to make the, the peptide more stable. And um, because it's based on the human immune system, there's very low risk of side effects. So what happens is Empton B binds to these target receptors located on the surface of neurons and other cells. And when it does so, it cascade, causes a cascade of reactions downstream signaling, which promote um, regeneration, decrease neuroinflammation and um, increase cell neuroplasticity, a range of um, positive uh, benefits that you'd, you'd want a drug to do if you had a neurodegenerative disease. Next slide, please. Next slide. So neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis have an enormous burden of disease. They, there's a huge unmet medical need and we need drugs that actually stop the disease, the disease in its tracks. However, currently there are no treatments available which are able to restore damage done to neurons themselves. Next slide. We know from the work we've done in vitro that Empton B is able to significantly promote neural survival and regeneration. We looked at cells from the cortex and hippocampus as these are areas of the brain that are associated with memory. Also of note, we've been able to regenerate damaged neurons in the spinal cord, which is indicating of potential use in spinal cord injury. Next slide, please. We've done efficacy studies in mice and shown that it significantly improved symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and slowed cognitive decline by more than 80%. And on top of that, we've also significantly decreased the amount of inflammation in the brain, which is attributed to the disease. Next slide, please. In a multiple sclerosis model, we were able to significantly increase the amount of myelin and the number of myelin forming cells. 
Interestingly, Empton B was 30% more effective than the current FDA approved drug called Capoxone, which had a peak annual sales of $4 billion. Um, it also increased neural cell survival, um, which is excellent and of course what we were hoping to see. Next slide, please. Next slide. Our ophthalmology R&D is focused on preventing degenerative conditions of the optic nerve. Currently, over 5% of the population suffers vision loss due to damage of the optic nerve. And yet currently there are no drugs available uh, to treat the optic nerve once it's become damaged. Our lead indication is glaucoma, which, has the, which is the second leading cause of blindness in the, in the world, and optic neuritis, which is damage to the optic nerve caused by an inflammatory response. Next slide. Our R&D program in ophthalmology is built upon this foundational data in which we were able to demonstrate regenerative capacity of fully severed optic nerves in rats. And what we've got here is a picture of an optic nerve which is being cut. As you probably already know, normally when nerves are cut, they don't grow back, which is what you see in this first image in the untreated eye. However, when we treated these optic nerves with Empton B's parent compound, metallothionine, we were able to show that the optic nerve regenerated by over 250% compared to the untreated eye. So this is what happened up to one single dose, and you can imagine how excited we were. Um, it, made us want to keep researching it to see whether Empton B would repair the nerves in other conditions affecting the optic nerve. Next slide. Here we've got data specific to Empton B in glaucoma in a pig model of severe glaucoma, which is the closest experiment to replicate human glaucoma pathology. You can see in the images here, the, in the tissue sample taken from the untreated eye, the, on the right, the cells are highly disrupted and they've degenerated and died whereas the retinal cells from the optic nerve are healthy and normal in the treated eye. This data demonstrates the disease modifying potential of Empton B in glaucoma. Next slide. Additionally, we demonstrated that Empton B is able to penetrate through the ocular tissue from the front of the eye to the back of the eye in tissue distribution studies. We've performed these tissue distribution studies over several time points that have been really impressed by how well the Empton B product penetrates through the layers of the eye and how long it hangs around for. In our 14 day study, Empton B was still detected in the ocular tissue after two weeks post administration, administration, indicating that patients will likely only need once a month dosing. We'll also be performing additional studies to examine the potential reformulation of Empton B also as an eye drop. Next slide. The company is at a critical point in our development where we have spent the last couple of years dedicating our resources towards completion of the extensive IND enabling preclinical program. I've now reached a stage where we're able to ready to transition into human studies. We'll be releasing our four week safety data in Primate soon, and this will be followed by IND safety data, which will allow us to commence our phase one trial as early as Q4 this year. Next slide. So to summarize, NSB is developing a peptide based drug called Empton B with a broad range of applications, but most focused on MS, Alzheimer's disease and glaucoma. To date, we've conducted numerous preclinical studies, both in vitro and in vivo, and have complete compelling data showing that it improves neural survival, decreases neuroinflammation and has a host of other positive benefits. In addition to our compelling preclinical data, we've got comprehensive information on the drug's mechanism of action and our programs um, supported by its strong safety data. Our next steps are to commence our first phase one human trial while continuing to collect IND enabling data. And I'll just end with saying this is a very high growth stock. We have multiple inflection points imminent. And thank you for listening to this presentation. And I hope this has excited you enough to get involved yourselves. Thanks so much. Thank you for that, Alex. It was a great presentation. We've had a few questions come through, so I'll jump into them. Um, so do you conduct your research in Australia or internationally? We, um, we actually collaborate with some of the best research institutes around the world. So that's important because our research is all independently um, validated by these external providers. And um, so the most, for the most part, these institutes are located in the US some in the UK and some in Australia. But um, when it comes to first in human trials, we'll be doing them in Perth, Western Australia, um, and then phase two, likely around Australia as well in different cities. 
Perfect. And just also, so how is the NSB drug administered? So the um, it's currently been formulated as an injection. Um, peptides are typically injected. Um, that will be a subcutaneous injection for Alzheimer's disease and, and MS. Um, however, when it comes to glaucoma, we're currently administering it as a injection into the eye, which is fairly common for, um, for other uh, indications like macular degeneration is a very common injection into the eye, but we're also reformulating it into an eye drop because, because of our data, which has shown how well it penetrates through the eye, layers of the eye. Perfect. Well, thank you for joining us again, Alex, and we look forward to hearing further updates. Thanks, Jane. So up next, we have a presentation from Space Talk with the ticker code SPA. To tell us more about the company's wearables communication technology, I'll now hand you over to founder and CEO, Mark Fortunato. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Jane. Thank you for having me. So, Let me bring up your screen. There we go. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So good morning, everyone. Um, there's a new fast emerging category emerging in the smartphone market, uh, which is for kids. Um, if you're a parent um, and with a young child, uh, younger than the age of 12, um, you really can't buy them responsibly a smartphone. Um, and um, up until now. Um, so Space Talk is a purpose-built smartphone, watch, and GPS device for kids between the ages of five to 12 before they get their own smartphone. Now, how this came about is that um, our company is actually 20 years old, and we're the company that discovered and then pioneered the use of text messaging in schools to inform parents if their child hasn't arrived to school as expected. Um, now, when a parent receives a text message like that, Typically, the next question they ask is, where are they? And trying to solve this problem over many years eventually got us to the point where we realized what we really need is an all-in-one smartphone watch and GPS device. So we were a software company. Uh, to embark on such an endeavor was quite an under uh, undertaking, but we did. Um, and um, after several years and a, a several failed attempts, uh, we finally got there. Um, so we launched our first device in 2017, coming up to four years ago. Um, and at that point in time, this was a totally unproven category device, um, very zero awareness. Um, but our sales pretty much took off from day one. Um, and after about three or four months, we approached JB Hi-Fi. Um, they decided to range us. And within three or four months, uh, we ended up being 3% of their wearables business. Um, and since then, we've grown on. We've grown to um, to range, be ranged with um, a number of operators uh, and retailers. All the mass market retailers in Australia, such as JB Hi-Fi, Harvey Norman, mm -hmm. Good Guys, um, um, Office Works, um, and by operators such as Telstra, uh, Vodafone, and many others in Australia and overseas. Um, so. The watch makes and receives phone calls, text messaging is a GPS locator, uh, but it's a device that is controlled by parents. So parents regulate who can the children can make and receive phone calls from, text messages, um, and, um, and what it really, you know, one of the most important things is what it doesn't have, which is access to open internet, um, social media, and YouTube. So they're the basic, uh, um, benefits that families receive from the watch. Um, however, from the operator's perspective, such as Telstra, um, what it does, it creates a, a tremendous new business opportunity because currently they are not responsibly anyway, or we're all selling smartphones to kids between the ages of five and 12. Typically their first customers they acquire at the age of about 12, when the child enters primary school, high school, I'm sorry. Um, and it costs the operator about $90 in terms of customer acquisition costs. With 
space talk, they can acquire the same customer at about a third of the price in revenue and profits from them from the age of five, um, and then account manage them into a smartphone at, when they're at the age of 12. Um, so it's a very strong business proposition um, from, for, for operators, um, and they're getting behind it and promoting it in a very significant way. So if you were to go into a Telstra shop, you'll see um, our watch display prominently in floor two ceiling, in fact, two story video displays um, in glass cabinets and um, with a great deal of um, um, marketing push behind it. Um, we've since uh, um, the launch, we've expanded overseas uh, with a number of operators uh, that are listed in the uh, presentation with the most recent being O2 um, in the UK who have 460 stores. Um, they launched only three weeks ago with a tremendous success. Um, and um, and uh, they're part of uh, Telefonica, which is the world's a third largest mobile operator after China Mobile and Reliance in India. Um, next slide, please. So what this sets us apart is that we own the entire um, technology stack. So we own the industrial designs, the firmware, the circuitry, the apps, the service, the lot. And we did all of that development work in Australia. Um, all of our competitors are rebranded off the shelf Chinese devices that you can just get on Alibaba or any one of those websites and just buy you know, $20, $30 and resell them. Um, and that's what our competitors are. So we're very different. And that's why we are the market leader um, in the operator space and arguably the market leader in the, in the world. So when we started four years ago, global sales were zero in the category. Uh, this year, they're about $150 million and uh, credible market research forecasters such as Gartner are predicting this uh, category to grow to $12 billion um, by 2016 or 2017. Um, so it's very likely that um, in the future, every child will have a device like this on their wrists. Um, uh, over, the, over time, you know, business models will innovate, um, device prices will come down. Uh, we have a range of devices. We're onto our third device now. Um, and recently, um, uh, we uh, spun our technology out into for the seniors market, which is, um, um, we we're finding that um, a percentage of, around about 5% of our watches were being bought for seniors. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'll leave this with you, but we have three devices in the market at the moment, two children's watches and one senior's watch. Uh, our senior's watch is fully funded by the government under the Commonwealth and um, Home Care Package and the um, uh, Home Support Package and by NDIS. So unless you're very wealthy, um, you're a senior, you'll get our Space Talk Life Watch for free. Next slide, please. An important and the most important part of our solution or product is the app. Um, the app uh, currently is predominantly um, a uh, the means by which parents and caregivers can figure out devices, but over time you'll see it morph to, pro to provide a whole range of um, additional services, um, applications um, that will become um, our most uh, significant revenue generating uh, component of our solutions. Um, next slide, please. We're, uh, we're growing at a phenomenal rate with tremendous achievements. Uh, we're in Australia, New Zealand, um, where we were in the UK, and we're launching in the US later this year. Um, we're getting strong interest from all mass market retailers um, and mobile operators around the world. Um, the uh, Based on the success um, our current partners are experiencing, most operators are saying uh, that it's not if they will range space talk, but when. Um, so um, we're very busily working, um, launching lots of retailers and uh, uh, operators um, um, at the moment. Um, next slide, please. We're growing um, at a compounded uh, annual growth rate of about 46%. Um, the, for the year just finished, we hit $15 million and we're growing profitably in the sense that our EBITDA gross profit is continuing to grow. Um, 
we're in a strong, well-funded position moving forward. Um, and we also have a, our schools business, which I mentioned previously, that is still there and, and doing uh, quite well, generating about 2.25 million um, in revenues with a very high gross profit margin. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll leave the, uh, this presentation is available on our website. I won't go through all the details with you, but um, this is a very fast growing category. Um, operators and mass market retailers, what they find when they launch Space Talk is that their category sales go up by about 3%. Um, we are considered um, a supplier in the, uh, in the magnitude um, of, um, you know, a significant supply um, right behind Fitbit and Garmin. Um, so, and this, but we're growing at a much faster rate. Um, and um, importantly, uh, there is a very strong social case for the device uh, and a very strong business case uh, for it as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, with our wrap, uh, there are a whole range of network effects to attract new users and retention. And now RAP generates um, an annual recurring revenue stream, which is growing very rapidly. We're approaching 3 million on an annual recurring revenue ba basis. Um, but that will become the main source of our revenue uh, moving forward. Um, next slide, please. Um, so look, I'll leave this with you. I won't go through all the minutiae detail here. Um, all this available on our website. Um, and I think my time is up. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to share our story with you. Mark, thanks so much for the great presentation. Uh, we've had a few questions come through, but we've only got time for one. So um, I'll jump into it. So does Space Talk have plans to develop additional devices for the market? So for example, a watch for customers aged between 18 to 35 to complement devices for kids and seniors? Um, we, we are actively working um, on uh, new devices, um, but, but not but for the children and for seniors. Um, the, the category for adults, you know, in other words, uh, 13 or 14 year olds through to 60, 70 year olds is very well serviced at the moment by Apple and Samsung. Um, so we have no intention in going into that category. Well, thank you, Mark. There were a few other questions that did come through, so we'll send them through to you. But if you do have any further questions for Mark, uh, I would encourage you to send through the details via the contact details on their ASX releases. But thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Next up, we are joined by Dr. Richard Mollard, the Chief Scientific Officer of Clinical Stage Drug Developer, Pharmost, with the ticket code PAA. To tell you more, I will introduce you to Richard. Thank you very much, Jane. Let me bring up your presentation for you. Thank you, Jane. So Pharmost is repurposing monopantil as a cancer neurodegenerative and antiviral therapeutic. So repurposing means that we're lowering the risks and costs of development. Next slide, please. So this is a company snapshot and all of these slides are available under PAA at the ASX. So I encourage you to interrogate them a bit further there. Um, next slide, please. So how is this all possible that Monopantil can start as a sheep dredge and have applications in cancer, neurodegeneration and viral infections? So this comes under the umbrella of repurposing, which is common in, pharmaceutical, in the pharmaceutical industry. So here we have a sheep dredge, which you see on the bottom left corner, hits the acetylcholine receptor, kills the worm outlined in black and also the larvae. It's specific for these worms. It doesn't, these receptors don't exist in sheep and they also don't exist in humans. Farmost was able to demonstrate off-target activity against a molecule called mTOR or the pathway of mTOR signaling. So mTOR has interesting origins in Easter Island, which is kind of fun to look up. 
But inhibiting mTOR, which monopantyl does, the signaling pathway, this induces autophagy, which has applications in cancer, where the cancer is pretty much instructed to destroy itself. In motor neuron disease, you can see here on the right, a motor neuron and inside the cell, you have misfolded proteins that accumulate and affect the function of the cell. So inducing autophagy helps clear those misfolded proteins. And for COVID infections, for example, as an antiviral or HTLV-1, these viruses hijack the autophagy machinery to form capsules and hide inside the cell and then be released to cause secondary infections. And monopantyl competes with the virus to say, look, you're not going to use this machinery and we will destroy you and eliminate you from the cell. So on the left are some famous examples, Viagra, Tamoxifen and Exanatide, where repurposing has generated extra value in other indications. Next slide, please. So Pharmos in this um, endeavour is protected by five patents, the fifth one to be awarded still. Um, and they have a long runway. And you can see at the bottom, coronavirus and HTLV1, if granted, expiring in 2040. Next slide, please. So to get into the clinic, Pharmos had to take a drench, which is given to sheep, and which is associated with an exceptionally high safety profile, which is available under a public release summary because it's registered as an anthelmintic by the APVMA in Australia. However, the problem is the drench doesn't taste so good and the liquid, the drug active monopantyl is dissolved in has a very poor taste. So we were able to take the active and in the bottom middle, you can see our convenient at-home tablets that are pressed. Next slide, please. For first proof, proof of concept as an anti-cancer drug, this is the latest data from our phase two trial in pet dogs with B-cell lymphoma. On the left, you can see the participants, their numbers, and next to that, they're arranged in ascending order of plasma drug levels attained. You can see we tried quite a few different doses to get the optimal dose. At the highest dose, we see some or minor weight loss in the dogs, which wasn't a concern to many vets, but to some. So we call that an adverse event. But if you drop the level of blood in the blood a little bit, we see no adverse effects of weight loss with plus or minus 2% of weight or changes over the 28 days. So a very safe drug. Next to that, we have all these green and red squares. So outcome observer is what the vet and the owner sees. Outcome veterinary is what happens if you interrogate with x-rays or ultrasound. So at the very bottom, you can see a lot of red and there's a progressive disease in these dogs who do not actually get enough monopantyl. Then above that, you see there's a lot of green. Where there's red, it's quite ambiguous or marginal. And this is because vets will disagree because the changes are so minor, where some will say, well, look, we don't see any change, and some say, well, we do. Some say this change may not be attributable to the drug. It may be attributable to the disease. And other people say the opposite. So we have ordered these in ascending order of plasma levels. And in the middle, you see quite a good spot where there are really no adverse effects. And all these dogs really have stable disease, at least five of seven by interrogating with thoracic and X-ray or imaging. So we're taking this dose forward into um, a phase three trial, which we're planning now. We were fortunate enough that several of the veterinarians thought the monopantyl was working so well that they would keep monopantyl going and give prednisolone at the same time. And we were able to follow up to six dogs off trial. They all did quite well. Four of them did very well with over 100 days or greater than 14 weeks and some still going on. And this is compared to standard of care prednisolone alone, which usually gives four to six weeks. 
So the dogs on trial had high quality of life. You can see the dogs on the right going camping with their family, playing in the park with their dogs, and they had very good longevity. Although with prednisolone, this is retrospective analysis and we will still analyze it, but we're very encouraged by this data to go forward into a phase three. This is compared to alternative um, standard of care as well, CHOP chemotherapy, which might give 26 weeks, but is associated with a lot of side effects and has a high cost around $10,000. So the dog's hair might fall out, they vomit, they may defecate on the carpet. The kids cannot play with the dogs because the chemotherapy is toxic. So we think combining with prednisolone, for example, is going to provide a tremendous value proposition. And we're also interested in combining with CHOP to see if we can improve the quality of life. Next slide, please. As far as uh, motor neuron disease goes, on the right-hand side, you can see the brain with the nerve cell, and this innovates the muscle. And when these proteins build up, unfortunately, these individuals lose motor control. So they lose locomotive ability, uh, speech, swallowing, eventually respiration. And unfortunately, life expectancy is very short. It is a rare disease, one in 400 people, and there are no cures. But you see the middle bottom picture with the green semicircular structure, which looks a bit like a Pac-Man, and it's eating the purple and blue misfolded proteins and ingesting them and then eliminating them out. And this is mono how we hypothesize monopantil is working to stimulate um, elimination of these misfolded proteins and offer protection to individuals living with motor neuron disease. We're very fortunate to have been awarded $900,000 by Fight MND um, for our phase one trial. You can see Neil Danaher in the top picture there, who is the co-founder and proponent for Fight MND. And we'll be undertaking this trial next year with Susan Maders and Dominic Rowe. Next slide, please. So also we're looking at antivirus, antiviral applications. So once again, autophagy. And on the top right-hand picture, you can see the life cycle of a virus where on the left, the virus enters the cell, it releases its RNA, it replicates, subsequently gets packaged and then is eliminated from the cell. Our preclinical data on the left where we show uh, monopantil protects against cell death from SARS-CoV-2 in vitro. It reduces viral RNA load in the culture media. And in two laboratories under similar conditions, we see a reduction in viral secondary infection. In the third laboratory, which had very different conditions, we didn't see this reduction, but this enabled us to come up with the hypothesis the monopantil is acting later in the life cycle of the virus, you can see here, where the packaging goes on prior to release. So we're testing this hypothesis looking in HTLV1 infection as well. So we're lucky enough to work with a group who has fantastic preclinical models for looking at the mechanism of action in the life viral, a mechanism of action in the life viral cycle. So you can see the bottom right here, those green semicircular objects again. This is what the virus hijacks. Monopantil will say, no, you're not allowed to take our machinery and we're going to eliminate you through the normal elimination system. So we're looking to set up these clinical trials as well next year. Next slide, please. So this is our final indication for human cancer. As people might be aware, we conducted a successful phase one trial at Royal Adelaide Hospital where we demonstrated stable disease in three or four patients tested. Unfortunately, the bad taste of the original formula meant we stopped the trial early and hence made the tablets, which we will now take into phase two. We were able to show that we were, could inhibit mTOR signaling to induce autophagy, adverse events were mild, and the immune system wasn't compromised, which normally happens with chemo. So with monopantal, the immune system presumably can still fight the cancer itself at the same time. We are also able to get very good blood plasma drug data to take into phase two. We have several physicians who are very interested in our combinatorial work. You can see in the graphs in the bottom right, 
with gemcitabine and cisplatin. So gemcitabine for pancreatic cancer, cisplatin for gastric and esophageal cancer. In each graph at the top, that's control with no treatment. In the middle, those two lines are single treatment. The bottom line is combinatorial treatment, and you can see how effective it is. So we're looking to set these up next year. So next slide, please. So these are the timelines we're targeting. And as I said, these are available on the internet at the ASX, and I'm probably running out of time. So I would encourage you to look at these there. And final slide, please, as well. This is the management team who is responsible for this project. So thank you for your time. Richard, thank you for the great presentation. Um, we have had a question, but I'm going to jump into it anyway. So um, what news flow can shareholders expect over the coming period? So the coming period should be till the end of the year. We would be expecting to set up all of our manufacturing processes to be able to provide tablets for um, the trials coming up next year. Importantly, we'll be finalising dosing. We've got good idea of what dose we want to take for the phase three trial in dogs with cancer, but we still want to optimise how we give that, how many times a day, whether we give loading doses at exactly what level, and then we'll be able to take that information into the human trials later next year. Wonderful. Well, thank you for joining us, Richard. And a copy of today's recording will be available in the coming days on brokerbriefing.com. Thanks again. Thank you, Jen. So next up, we have a presentation from drug discovery and development company, Vectus Biosystems, with the ticker code VBS. I will hand you over to our non-executive director and deputy chairman, Maury Stank. Good morning, Maury. Good morning, Jane, and thanks for having me on. Let me pull up your presentation. So Vectus Biosystems is uh, focused on a global unmet need, which is uh, fibrosis, which is a progressive condition in the main cardiovascular system. And at the moment we have a lead and two emerging additional lead compounds, please. Uh, the company has been listed on the ASX. I'm pleased to say the market capitalization is significantly up on the number on this screen. Uh, our board consists of Dr. Ron Schneer, who is the Medical Director of IMED as our uh, Chairman, uh, myself, Dr. Karen Duggan, who's our CTO and co-founder, Mr. Peter Bush, who's a CA, and Dr. Susan Pond, who used to uh, head up Oz Biotech. Thank you. And when we talk about uh, the pharmaceutical indications, uh, we believe that A, Vectus is uh, a world leader in uh, the research of antifibrotics, and B, this is the largest single franchise in the world. Um, VB0004, which we now have in phase one, addresses not only hypertension, but cardiac, renal, and pulmonary fibrosis. VB832 addresses renal fibrosis, I'm sorry, uh, uh, pulmonary fibrosis of the liver, and finally, A79 is uh, very focused on uh, pulmonary fibrosis. We have an exceptional uh, compound, uh, a library of uh, patents, uh, many of them granted, but still with a long life uh, to be complete, uh, to go. Uh, we have a recent uh, $7 million round completed and uh, a strong uh, team, both at the board level and the executive level. Thank you. So there are a couple of features here that we need to talk about. Reimbursement in the pharmaceutical industry is generally uh, focused on matching existing drugs, be they generic or otherwise. But if you can have first in class, the, re the reimbursement is calculated on the uh, impact. And here you see the size of some of these markets. They're very significant. Next. So Vectors today uh, has really uh, worked with some of the largest pharmaceutical companies on the planet, and they've been very clear about what they want to see 
uh, when they uh, partner with a company such as Vectors. They need to understand the target. Uh, they prefer to see a platform technology rather than a single compound. It's got to be transformational. What that means is it has a significant clinical effect. It's not just uh, a drug that uh, may give you a short period of, of benefit. Um, we've had very strong animal model studies. We've demonstrated our toxicology and safety. Our IP portfolio is very, very broad and deep. We've proven we can synthesize the drugs. We've got a very cost competitive manufacturing and our IP covers uh, both indications. We're now in a phase one uh, study and as we've announced, we're moving into the third cohort of the SAD study and we'll be producing human uh, PD efficacy data. Thank you. So in addition to the work, we've also published uh, giving validation to the target. Thank you. And here you see uh, two really important points. One, we're having a profound effect on systolic blood pressure, which is the harder to manage. But secondly, we're doing it through functional changes, not artificially depressing the blood pressure reading. And this demonstrates a uh, outcome which is the result of taking uh, fibrotic scar tissue and making it functional again. Thank you. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see the progression uh, in our controlled studies. The blue uh, on the top right is showing um, fibrotic damage. Uh, we go through the 18 weeks and at the end, you can see on the bottom right, there is perfectly normal uh, architecture and tissue. And this is not only slowing down disease progression, this is reversing it. Thank you. Similarly, we see this in the kidneys, as I've said before, uh, people going on to dialysis have a massive uh, impact socially and individually, and the costs are between 50 and 150,000 per patient. So similarly, you see here on the right hand side, the significant effect uh, from the top right to the bottom right. Thank you. And Pulmonary fibrosis is something we're all hearing about because it is one of the potential outcomes of severe uh, COVID disease. And again, we see a significant impact in not only stopping disease progression, but reversing it at the 20 week period. Thank you. And again, uh, what's really important is the pharmaceutical industry favors orally dosable uh, drugs. Uh, we started off with a peptide, which, uh, as a previous speaker mentioned, needs to be injected. But now we have a mimetic or a synthetic, which is an orally dosable one day, uh, one pill a day uh, presentation. And that is um, really um, the key for uh, the pharmaceutical interest. Thank you. So we've done a broad range of work uh, in addressing the safety prior to this phase one trial. And we've doubled the normal period of the, uh, of the uh, toxicity studies. So we're able to run these studies now uh, out for a longer period, i.e. 28 days. And that will segue uh, into the 1B trials where we hope to show some uh, efficacy and impact. Thank you. So as I mentioned before, um, we've manufactured this in uh, full pharmaceutical standards successfully now uh, multiple times and the cost of production is very attractive and there really is um, no benchmark in terms of the likely um, price that the pharmaceutical companies would charge but it would relate to the health economics and we expect those to be substantial. Thank you. So our intellectual property portfolio uh, covers the path to discovery, the peptide fragments and the composition of the mimetics and the methods of use and the manufacturing. We've had a lot of people looking at this patent portfolio and to our knowledge, 
not a single valid objection has been raised throughout the entire uh, filing process. Thank you. So as we've announced the market, we're in phase one. That means we're trialling a single ascending dose at the moment, and those trials are moving into the third cohort. Then we'll move to a multiple ascending dose uh, where the patients or the subjects will be on uh, for the uh, entire period. Um, we're working with uh, well-identified biomarkers, and we're looking at the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic studies. Uh, we also have found in the preclinical work we, we've done a very significant um, ability for dosing. In other words, some drugs need to be titrated very carefully. Uh, in our case, that doesn't seem to be an issue, and um, the side effects uh, seem to be um, minimal. Thank you. So liver disease... Um, is a major unmet need because particularly in this part of the world, in Asia Pacific, uh, there's been uh, hepatitis quite endemic. And whilst there are drugs that can stop the disease, it doesn't necessarily stop the fibrotic progression. Thank you. And go next slide, please. So this is really um, very, very stark. If you look at the 20 week control, um, these are actually reversed. So on the right-hand side, you have the starting point. On the left-hand side, you see this near-normal architecture and a, a very significant turnaround in disease. Thank you. As I mentioned before, pulmonary fibrosis is generated by pollution, diesel particles, occupational health, uh, such as silica, coal, etc and many other causes. Uh, we uh, believe that um, the compounds that we have in our library will progress into human trials uh, as significant candidates to avoid um, disease progression. And in fact, we hope to reverse function and, uh, and health. Thank you. Again, blood pressure is an indication that we're doing something and that, that is functional not just suppressing the blood pressure. Thank you. And again, the data on pulmonary fibrosis is impressive. If you look at the left to the likely progression to the right, uh, in the middle we have VB0004 and A79, and both of them have improved uh, the outcomes from the starting point, leave alone not allowing any disease progression. Thank you. Similarly, you can see uh, here on our A79. Thanks. We've started to get uh, interest in Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases, and um, we believe that um, this uh, accumulation of tau proteins may be something uh, we have a role in. Thank you. Just want to recap, the patent portfolio is extensive and has a long runway and we continue to file new IP. Thank you. So Jane, thanks very much. I'll pass to you. Laurie, thanks so much for the great presentation. We've had some questions, so I'll jump into them. So VBS recently announced the successful completion of the second of the five planned cohorts in the SAD segment of the human trial. Can you please tell us what this means for the company? Yeah, so um, obviously uh, we're very pleased to see the human results reflecting our um, preclinical work, our animal work and our cell work. And of course, in a practical sense, the further we go down the phase one trials, the further de-risked is uh, our proposition that VB0004 will be a high impact and very valuable drug. And just on that, so what will the impact be if VB0004 is successful? Look, uh, if we look at the uh, global statistics for uh, pharmaceutical transactions, uh, they tend to happen uh, around this time. And clearly we've had interest and continue to have interest. And we hope by Q1 of 2022 calendar year, we'll have completed our 1B 
and we'll be on our way to um, global opportunities. Wonderful. Thanks, Maury. So a copy of today's presentation will be available online on brokerbriefing.com in the coming days. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Jane. Next up, we have a presentation from Nanoview with the ticker code NVU, a company specialised in modern cutting-edge nanotechnology. To tell us more, I will introduce you to Nanoview's Executive Chairman and CEO, Alfred Chong. Good morning. Thank you, Jane. Good morning. Let me bring up your presentation. Great, thanks, uh, Jane. Um, next slide, please. Um, I started Nanoview in 2012, um, primarily because we're based in Singapore and sit on one of the best uh, technical resources. Uh, we draw our inspiration, we draw our techni technical skills from a number of different institutions in Singapore. ASTAR is the largest research institute NTU, uh, the, the Nanyang Technology University, and we take the science that they've developed over decades and we try to commercialize that. And we do it with a very small, lean team, but um, basically expounding on, on very good science. So we started Nanoview with, in deep tech when deep tech was not even um, a name. And, and uh, we've IPO'd the company in 2018 and we continue to develop products. And so we have four currently, uh, and I'll talk about uh, the most relevant one today, which is NanoShield. Uh, that's not to give less credence on the others. Um, touching on it in a couple of um, seconds, Custom Skins is a vending machine with a lot of AI and robotics built in. So you typically go to the machine, pick the phone that you want, put in the phone that um, um, your, your cell phone, and it essentially laminates for you in up to 150 micron accuracy. Obviously that it also destroys all the viruses on, on your phone and basically allows you to choose and, 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 and exist in areas where low co uh, high cost labor jurisdictions disallow that to happen. iFix is another very important um, part of our, our journey where we, um, develop, we are developing a product in which allows you to take your phone or any high digital display, put our technology on top of it, which is a screen protector and dial in your actual diopter settings. And through that, it, we're able to see uh, our phones and the high resolution displays without reading glasses. Next slide, please. So a little bit about myself, you know, um, I actually lived in the US for about 18 years and have built several companies um, and have moved back to Singapore uh, as a Singaporean. We started Nanoview right after moving back. We had a number of other different uh, directors in, in, uh, in Australia and one in the US. And together with a team of about 15 people, we're executing on our current uh, um, products. Next slide, please. So again, uh, the journey started in, in about uh, 2012 and uh, our current and most relevant product is a product called NanoShield. Um, I was working uh, on a product in 2019, um, which is an antimicrobial uh, screen protector, unknow unknowingly that the uh, virus, was, uh, the pandemic was just around the corner. Uh, obviously when, when that turned in February of last year, uh, we had we were quickly able to come up with a product in very short order with a lot of signs uh, right around and, and started shipping product uh, middle of last year. Uh, we intend to then move forward this year in commercialization of custom skins. Uh, and in 2020, uh, the vision correction product that is currently in development and will be introduced next year. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the um, NanoShield. It's, it's, it's a product, it's topical, it's current. Uh, it's a little simple piece of plastic that has a lot of science involved. And essentially when you put wrap the plastic over any high touch points, it will destroy the coronavirus. 
in order to do that, uh, we've had to engineer the product from, from scratch. Uh, it's got a very high polymer matrix with, started off with a, a active ingredient that's patented in Japan. And that then gets formed through a very high um, exacting manufacturing um, facilities in Japan, and then eventually providing a final product. And the product exists in various forms. Uh, it's, it comes in a, in a roll like this. It comes in a tape like this that allows you to essentially wrap around anything that you touch very often. And, and that would essentially kill the virus in, in co on contact. It is also optically clear. Uh, we believe that we're one of the few in the world that has this attribute. So you can actually put it onto your phones and your touch screens, uh, and that essentially protects you. It's also very easy to install, literally uh, just by having it on any high touch point, it takes seconds to just lay it down with very high quality glue. And we, uh, and, and obviously we're very heavily tested. We've got efficacy and science that's been tested around the world. Next slide, please. So this is uh, an important uh, slide primarily because I think um, with the pandemic, everybody has been touting to essentially have, um, have the next best thing uh, to combat the disease. So we started off uh, from that premise. We, we, we uh, having started a, our journey a little bit before the pandemic, we were able to have our product tested and tested uh, and essentially have it to the point whereby um, it has the merits of testing across the world, including the US, Japan, Australia, Singapore. And with that science, uh, we can demonstrate that within minutes, it, can, it is not only relevant to the coronavirus or to the SARS-CoV-2, it's also relevant to everyday viruses that we live with, E. coli, uh, influenza, norovirus that causes um, stomach flu. And we were lucky that in the early days, um, we were able to be tested by a very, very large company who decided to look for a product to offer uh, solutions to their customers. So this uh, test, which is the one on the left-hand side, um, took a lot of effort because it's, it's, it was tested on the actual SARS-CoV-2 virus, which can only be done if you had a class three facility because dealing with that virus is extremely dangerous. So you have to encapsulate yourself in a, in a, in a, in a suit and then have your product tested uh, in the event that it escapes, uh, if you, the, the researcher and the tester is protected. So that science is actually peer reviewed. It took about 10 months uh, to get that done. And the link is on our website uh, so that any customer or anybody that's looking for a solution can click onto it and be assured that it's a product that actually works. And being a piece of plastic, you literally can have it plastered onto any high touch point and it would work and work. It does not evaporate. It does not wear out unless you physically scratch it. So we have a lifespan of about one hour. Next slide, please. So as I explained, the uh, product has very, very uh, myriad of, of use cases uh, in its um, most nascent form. It's a piece of plastic that you put onto touch screens and it can be on the touch screen that you sign your uh, parcels on when someone delivers a parcel to you. It can be a touch screen uh, in the ATM. It can be a touch screen when you, when you start traveling again. Uh, and that's important because instead of wearing gloves or, or wiping the touch screen every so often, uh, it can be just wiped and clean in one day. And essentially that protects uh, the users uh, from, from touching the screen right after the previous user uses the product. It can also be used for doors and, and, and uh, essentially anything that um, you would be able to um, use your hands to open up, to touch, to, uh, to operate. Uh, we're also very, very popular in, in uh, 
in trolleys uh, in supermarkets uh, where you would have um, instead of being able to, to wipe it down every time you use a trolley were relevant because you know it's something which uh, which which stays on and and protects itself after each use including all the the push doors and 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 everything that we we, we use on a daily basis next slide please so we are expanding uh, our network um, starting the journey only um, last year we've had fairly good success um, throughout the world in some areas we are very very successful uh, philippines in particular uh, india is coming up uh, in the us we are looking to uh, do the distribution ourselves so we are forming joint ventures and uh, looking at specificity on on corporate customers that want to protect not only themselves but their customers so um, we we a lot of the um, the capital that we're raising right now allows us to do exactly that um, sales and marketing is, is not trivial um, reaching customers is not trivial um, and we believe that we know how to do that and therefore this current capital raise is to do exactly that and to do it well and to do it with with good partners around the world that have demonstrated this capability is is the next uh, order of business so we've had a uh, pretty good um, growth uh, ever since we started shipping the product. Uh, we're early in the journey, uh, um, but having the product which is topical and which everybody uh, needs today, especially with the pandemic, puts us in a very, very strong and good position. Um, you know, just year on year from last year, we are at over 2000% in terms of revenue increase. Um, we hope to demonstrate that going forward uh, because uh, the product that we have right now is, is what most people need. Um, we, we, you know, we have requests all around the world uh, for different types of the product, which I'll explain uh, next. And, um, and this is something which, which uh, essentially um, is better down on, on four essential hallmarks. Um, and um, it's basically better down with, with a spray, a film, and essentially that also couples with, with a wet wipe and into a product which we're developing, which is called a Master Batch. We believe the pandemic is something which uh, is here to stay. It's going to be around us. Uh, and having a product which, is, which, is, uh, which you spray and you protect uh, in the current regime is, is not something which is as important as having a product that's embedded uh, in products in the future. So we, we, uh, we hope to provide this particular uh, path through a, a product called uh, Master Batch Series. And throughout the, throughout the next uh, few months, you will actually see that. And, and I think that would underpin our growth going forward. Next slide, please. So as uh, you see here, uh, our next capital raise uh, is would allow us to raise about 3.5 million that would put us into a very strong position on a fairly small market cap. Uh, and that allows us to, uh, and our shareholders to benefit from this journey. Uh, a lot of other companies in the same realm is the same um, market space have seen very, very high growth. We think we are in a position to do that. We think we are very early in uh, the stage of growth. So investing at this time would allow us, the management team and our shareholders to benefit from this journey. Next slide, please. So we are in the early stage of our journey, as I mentioned, uh, we have a very, very um, expanded product range coming online. That includes the spray that I mentioned, uh, that includes the film that we're shipping, uh, and that will also include a number of new products which will essentially make us 
relevant to just about anything that's being made going forward. And that includes the tabletops, the chairs that we sit on, uh, anything that is has a high touch point that's made of plastic and eventually into textiles because um, and that also includes uh, the product which we just released, which is the antiviral face mask. Um, we have a science that's also validated that's adopted by a fortune 100 company in the world uh, they've they've uh, given us credence they've validated our product uh, and they've adopted our product uh, worldwide that we're shipping um, that also includes um, 22 countries around the world uh, we have new deals that we've just announced including a company which uh, distributes our product through most ATMs worldwide as, as, uh, as well. So together with the regulatory framework that we're building, uh, we hope to see very high revenue growth uh, coming forward. And we invite uh, investors to take part in this journey going forward. Next slide, please. So I think this, um, I've kept this very short and everything else is, is in the website and I encourage all of you to um, to look at that uh, and to obviously email me um, if there are any specific questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alfred, for the great presentation. So we've got a few questions that have come through, so I'll jump into it. Um, you mentioned that Tenanibu has some strong revenue over the last half year. So what's in the pipeline for the next half year and of the financial year to continue this growth? I think we've invested early on, Jane, with the regulatory framework, uh, in particular in the US. Uh, other companies within our space um, don't have that framework. So we, we announced an MOU with a company uh, that has an EPA um, regulatory framework that we're, we're abiding to. So with that, we will see a good growth in the US. In Singapore, for example, we're one of two companies that are listed in the National Environment Agency. So bending down on, on, on the regulatory framework would allow us to grow our revenue, which can be you know, as high as seven digit on one particular deal if that transacts. Well, just on that actually, Alfred, um, so another webinar attendee has asked, what's NanoShield's advantage over the current gold standard uh, antimicrobial coatings, which are widely used in public places? Well, it's, uh, it has five distinct advantages. We start off with the active ingredient, and then we, we couple that with a very, very high regimented manufacturing uh, regime, which then gets translated with the efficacy that we have done uh, on certifications, and then essentially the validation by the, um, by the um, Fortune 500, uh, 100 company. So you put all those ingredients together, we find, you'll find that the product is fairly unique and therefore, uh, and, and then it lasts, right? You put it around on a high touch point, it doesn't evaporate, it doesn't go away. As long as you can eyeball that, it works and it'll kill the virus within 15 minutes. <laughs> Well, thank you, Alfred, for the presentation. And of course, all presentation recordings will be available online on brokerbriefing.com in the coming days. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye. So next up, we have a presentation from Advanced Materials Company, Archer Materials, with the ticker code AXE, to tell us more about Archer's 12CQ qubit processor. Today, we are joined by the CEO, Mohammed Shakir. Hello, Mohammed. Hi, Jane. How's it going? Beautiful audio test. Can you all hear me? Yes, you're perfect. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be addressing you today. Um, uh, I, would, I would like to introduce you today to the global scale of opportunity that our technology represents. Uh, and, and as Jane is loading up our um, uh, presentation here. Um, so I, I wanted to start by saying that um, I wanted to introduce you to the global scale of opportunity that our technology represents and really to give you an overview of the wonderful work that Archer is doing in this domain. And you know, really the way we're going about doing this work um, and, and also um, the, 
the, the excitement I think it's generating and why as a consequence of all this, uh, Archer is, is worth your attention and your consideration. Uh, thank you, Jane. Next slide. The images in this presentation are ours, right? So the people that you see are people that uh, work at Archer, work with Archer, the, the facilities that we operate are from. So for example, in this image, we have Archer staff in you know, $150 million research and prototype foundry that we operate from. Um, and, and really our strategy at Archer involves building advanced semiconductor devices. Uh, Jane, next slide, please. So it's important you know, to acknowledge the industry that we operate in, the semiconductor industry, and to put our work into context. Uh, the semiconductor industry is one of the largest industries in the world and you know, one of the most important. Uh, and the long-term outlook you know, for this industry is quite positive. You know, despite its recent supply chain challenges that have emerged, um, you know, ironically, these really further illustrate and highlight the industry's importance. Uh, Jane, next slide, please. And if there's you know, one thing I want you to walk away with today, it is that we are one of very few companies in the world building a quantum computing chip and the only one listed on the ASX doing so. Next slide, please. At Archer, we have a focus on a few key areas to generate value. And this involves technology development really at the cutting edge. Uh, IP prosecution and partnerships with other global players, both small and large. But it's you know, really important to make a distinction here that we're not just a company working solely on developing a quantum computing chip. We are a semiconductor company building a number of high impact technologies. But today in the interest of time, I will focus my talk on our flagship quantum computing technology, our 1-2-CQ chip. Next slide, please. This is some publicly available information. It's a quick uh, snapshot of the company and shows, you know, really that we're sharply focused and, and have no corporate debt. All this information can be found online. Next slide, please. And really with that focus, uh, you know, what that means is you know, we have a clear strategy that we've been executing over the last few years. You know, our growth is not a result of, of overnight success. It's a result of the quality of work we are doing the quality of people at Archer and the quality of the organizations that we work with. Next slide, please. So let's go for it, right? I mean, quantum computing, what's it all about? You know, why is it so disruptive? Why is it so revolutionary? I mean, is it really believable? Next slide, please. The first question to answer is, how is quantum computing different to modern day computing? Well, it's a whole new way of computing. It requires a new set of skills and new technology. And this new way of computing requires a critical piece of technology, a device called a qubit processor. It's a quantum chip. We'll refer to it as a quantum chip. And technologically at Archer, we do have a unique value proposition that holds up as a world first. And it's that our qubit processor could allow for quantum computation at room temperature on board modern devices. This qubit processor is currently under development. It is a world first. And this for quantum computing is an astounding proposition and one that we can back up with many years of R&D. And yes, we started building our technology. It's not pie in the sky, right? A lot of work has gone into this technology. And you know, as you can imagine, given what, given, you know, what we're dealing with, it is very highly complex. So I'll try and simplify it um, by saying that you know, Archer's objective is to build a quantum computing chip that could function at normal conditions on board modern day devices. It's a challenge, but we're on the way to achieving this. And it's you know, really absolutely exciting to be in this position. Thank you, Jane, next slide. But in saying that we're not actually doing this for fun, right? I mean, there's, there's a big demand for this technology once it's available. And there is a demonstrated commitment by the biggest economies in the world that it's going to happen, right? And what's important is at Archer, we aren't playing catch up. Next slide, please. And with this really leads me into an overview of, of Archer's 1-2-CQ qubit processor chip technology. 
we have the key ingredients to be successful in the computing industry, the technology and the human capital. The critical point on this slide is the last bullet point. And as I said, in quantum computing, this is an astounding proposition. In your modern day computing, not so much. It works at room temperature. It works at practical conditions. But I just want to be able to you know, illustrate this proposition. So Jane, just the next slide. Thank you. So I really wanted to illustrate this proposition. I mean, it, this, this slide here is the most important slide of my presentation because this is the technology value proposition at the core of our commercial opportunity that our technology could potentially enable the widespread use of quantum computing powered devices. And I'm sure that you would agree that this is a competitive advantage that's worth protecting and this is a technology that's worth developing. Next slide, please. Now, but what do I mean by could potentially enable widespread use of quantum computing powered devices? Look, it's, it's, it's an open secret that quantum computing would give nations right, a competitive advantage because it would, you know, it would really address all sectors dependent on computational power, this ever increasing need for computational power. Each of these sectors that are shown here could benefit tremendously with the advent of advanced computing, like quantum computing, and especially in quantum powered mobile devices or QPMDs. Next slide, please. Look, and there are real uses for quantum computing. It's already happening, right? However, it is currently limited in scope. But look, in the last five years, quantum computing has seen an extraordinary growth in, in its applications and potential applications. Uh, the key for Archer at this early stage, indeed in the early stage of the entire industry, um, not just in the early stage of our development, is in really positioning our technology where there are clear benefits for mobile use. And it's really exciting to think that, you know, when we consider the roadmaps of, of IBM and, and other uh, large organizations, you know, where the industry will be in the years ahead. Next slide, please. So look, much of the technicality, technicalities of quantum computing are really beyond the scope of this presentation. Um, but um, if Jane, you just go to the next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure you have questions relating to the technology and, and the specifics, but look, I, I'm sure there'll be opportunities in the future to discuss this with, with our team. Um, the important thing to note here is, um, you know, to unlock all this value in, in, in quantum computing and what it promises at, at its technology maturity, yeah, it's exactly that, the technology hardware needs to mature and therefore needs to be developed, right? Um, so it's important to let you know who is leading our development. It's important because as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's a complex business. This technology is not easily understood and it requires people with a particular set of skills. And I'm, I'm proud to say that, that we have those people at Archer. Next slide, please. For some of you, you know, you may be wondering, I mean, if you're coming across Archer for the first time, you may be wondering, well, you know, Archer is a small outfit, you know, how can we do it? How can we compete? Uh, look, the reality is we're, we're not doing it by ourselves, right? We're, we're already in partnership with an undoubted world leader in, in computing, Big Balloon, IBM. Uh, our partnership with IBM is unique. We are the first Australian company building a quantum computing processor to join the invite only global IBM quantum network. This quantum network is made up of 130 constituents, you know, Fortune 500 companies, startups, national research facilities. It's absolutely incredible. Um, but our focus is on, is on building the chip and working with IBM to demonstrate it works. And I, and I just want to make it clear that we're not trying to build the entire computer. Um, and this is because a question I'm frequently asked is, you know, what does a quantum computer look like for the user? Um, you know, this slide, you know, really, Anti, in an anti-climax way illustrates you know, what we see when we access real quantum computers at IBM. I mean, the principal point you know, here is that you know, we just want to show you that a quantum computing is real. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. You know, and, and, and IP is important. It really is. And, and it's fantastic to have uh, you know, patents related to the 1-2-CQ chip granted this year in Japan, Korea, and China. And, 
you know, real powerhouse Asian economies, absolutely wonderful. And we, we have pattern applications uh, progressing in the US, uh, Australia, Europe, and Hong Kong. So look, I encourage you all to read our patterns, the specifications really uh, to go through them, uh, really to fully grasp the, the broad nature and, and the global competitive advantage that Archer holds. It, it really is difficult to erode. We are protecting a new technology, a quantum computing chip. And this is a paradigm shift in computing. You know, look, in order for Archer to participate in the global semiconductor industry, we must have pattern protection in the largest economies in the world. We must protect our commercial interests that allow us to really exploit the technology over the longer term. And patents are one way that allows us to do that. And it's really important to note before we move on to the next slide that you know, we are one of very few companies. Now, Archer is one of few companies in the world in the semiconductor industry with a patent portfolio protecting quantum computing chip technology. Next slide, please. So I, I hope that I've painted a good picture of what we do as a, a high-tech semiconductor company in Australia. And look, just in conclusion, I guess, you know, some questions you may have are, you know, where are you at now? Have you made one of these things yet? Uh, how far away are you from making one of these devices? Look, what I will say is that Archer is, is building itself into a semiconductor company. And, and this is our strategy now and going forward. We have set commercial roadmaps for our technologies and we are at the point of where we need to be. So there's a lot to look forward to at Archer in the year ahead. And, and I think, you know, what you'll see is, you know, if you look back at our announcements and you know, what, what I think you'll see is a, a track record of high impact outcomes. And outcomes are not based on a, on a single metric, which is typical of other industries. So look, I, I hope today that I've, convey, I've conveyed to you some of the, the excitement of, of what we're doing and, and really how eminently worthwhile it is. And, and now on that note, thank you very much for your attention and, and happy to take questions, Jack. Well, Mohammed, as always, great presentation. We've had quite a few actually come through, so I'm trying to combine them into, into one. So, um, what I can imagine. I can yeah. imagine. It's not, not going to be an easy job for you, Jane. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, what are the applications of quantum computing? That, that's a good question. I mean, look, we have to put things into context, right? Um, quantum computing has made a lot of strides in the last decade. It, it's absolutely been wonderful to see, and it still is in the early stages of development and, and broad commercial applications are still years away. I just wanna make that clear, right? But generally speaking, I think a consensus is emerging in, in the quantum computing economy, um, you know, around applications of quantum computing at tech maturity. And I think what's happened is now that there are you know, four principal computational problems. Um, and I'm gonna dive straight in here, right? Where, where quantum machines, I'll call them machines, could be, uh, beneficial and and these four problems you know amazingly lead to hundreds of business use cases that are really envisioned to unlock value for end users in the coming decades right as the hardware matures and and these four problems involve bear with me there's some jargon here right but i'll try and unpack it all right so there's simulation optimization machine learning is probably a term that people have used um, and cryptography um you know in areas like simulation you would have seen one of my slides. There was a whole heap of publications already out there, hundreds of publications, um, you know, around these kinds of four areas. Simulation, major potential in, in drug discovery, um, in, in battery design, fluid dynamics, in, in the financial services sector around derivatives and pricing of options. You, you'll see a lot of large organizations now very publicly coming out saying that they're performing experiments with quantum computers uh, within their business units. Um, another area is around optimization, and this may not mean a lot to anyone right now, but optimization really is embedded in, in current technology. You know, when you think about brute logistics and portfolio risk management, um, you know, machine learning, I don't have to go on about this, and, and cryptography, obviously, with enabling, you know, stronger encryption standards. You can see that, um, and I do emphasize at maturity, um, you know, quantum computers have the potential to really impact almost every sector that's dependent on an increase in computational power. So it, it is broad um, and, and the, the examples are quite interesting. We, we did um, share with our shareholders through our newsletter, and I, I do recommend um, if you're listening today to sign up to our newsletter. We did it um, 
you know, share an interesting report by the Boston Consulting Group recently that does cover many of these areas and goes deeper into these areas. So I, I do recommend uh, visiting our website and, and looking that up. Thanks, Mohammed. There's been quite a few just on the team. So yeah. um, a lot of people are asking about how many employees and contractors does Archer have and, and who's going to be manufacturing the solution? Yeah, look, that's a good question. We get it all the time. People are interested in who works with us. Um, you know, I'll, I'll use a, a quote that, that some people tend to use out in the media and, and, and in online uh, and out there. And that's we, we have a handful of people. Um, and, you know, to say that, but you know, the handful of people that we have are the best in the business. Uh, you, you, you can certainly uh, cut it in a big league um, with the kinds of people that work at Archer and with Archer. And we are looking to grow the team and we're looking to grow the team in tandem with the development of our technology. Um, and it's absolutely exciting. I mean, we have people at Archer that are really pioneers in their field. I mean, you're talking about people like Martin Fuchsler who, you know, came up with the single atom transistor. Um, I'm not going to toot my own horn, um, but, you know, you can have a look at, you know, the kind of impressive uh, history and, and experience that, you know, people have brought to Archer. We've been able to retain and really start to attract um, some, some wonderful people to, to join our company. So um, I hope that's answered your question, Jane. Perfect. And just quickly for our last one, uh, so what news flow can shareholders expect over the coming months? Yeah, look, I mean, we, we've had a, a very clear kind of three-prong approach, um, you know, around commercial development, technology development, and, and our prosecution of our intellectual property. And I think, you know, moving forward, the, the, the things that we, we report and, and um, keep our shareholders informed of is it's definitely around our technological uh, developments and our advances there and our progress. It is a world first. It is absolutely exciting. Um, and, and I'm... I'm very happy that many of our shareholders have had a chance to come around and, and look at the facilities where we work and, and meet the people we work with. You know, the dozens of, of engineers, semiconductor foundry engineers, physicists, theoreticians, chemists, biologists, um, absolutely wonderful the people that we work with in Australia and around the world. Um, and, and also around our commercial development, right? Um, you know, we're working with some amazing companies in the quantum computing industry, you know, companies like uh, Max Kelson, who are also part of the IBM Quantum Network, where we're building, you know, and, and we're working on developing really cutting edge um, uh, quantum algorithms and, and um, you know, working with KISS-Kit, the software development kit or IBM. It, it's absolutely wonderful and, and uh, really gets me out of bed in the morning and, and um, keen and eager to, to communicate this to, to everybody over the next uh, six to 12 months. Well, Mohammed, as always, thank you for joining us. I think last time you were on the on broker briefing, the share price was circa 20 cents. So for any of the webinar attendees that joined up then, they'll be very happy. <laughs> well, thanks very much for having us, Jane. Thank you. And thanks you all for joining us today for the broker briefing investor webinar. Of recordings of today's presentations will be available online in the coming days on brokerbriefing.com. And we look forward to hosting you again soon.